Hi guys, my name is Arya and I welcome you all into this Opium tutorial. Now before we jump into this video, let me just give you guys a brief overview on the topics that I intend to cover throughout the course of this video. So firstly, we will be looking into a tool called Appium. So the first topic that we are going to be tackling is called what is Appium. Then we are going to go into the types of applications that are there for mobile industry. Then we will also discuss why you should choose Appium by comparing Appium to its market competitors. Then we will go ahead and discuss the Appium architecture and of course how it works. After that, we will be discussing the philosophy on which Appium was built on. And we will also be discussing the pros and cons of actually using Appium. In the end, I will be talking about the dependencies that Appium actually depends on. And we will also be doing a installation of Appium desktop version, that is Appium 1.10 from scratch using Android Studio. And we will also be integrating it. In the end, I'll also give you guys a brief introduction to the desired capabilities part which is there in the Appium documentation. Now the first topic for today is what is Appium? Now, if you guys have seen, today there is a general trend of automating almost everything that has a pattern in it. Whether it be emails or whether it be Google Forms or whether it be uploading files, tasks like web scraping or anything that can be put into a pattern. Like there are particular steps that you are following like step one if for writing an email is go ahead and hit the compose button on Gmail and then there are a few steps that you have to follow and everybody knows how to send an email. But the point I'm trying to drive across here that if you can tell an automating tool that these are the steps to follow for every single email that there is there then a tool can very well automate what you want to do. Now the same crux or you could say the same fundamental is being used in the mobile software industry. Now in the mobile testing industry, especially in the testing area, automation has become quite the norm. Now today we are going to be talking about Appium. So Appium is basically a tool that is being used for automated testing of native application, web-based application and even hybrid applications. Now let me give you guys much more refined introduction to what exactly Appium is. Appium is a freely distributed open source mobile application UI testing framework. Now Appium allows native hybrid and web application testing and supports automation tests on physical devices as well as an emulator or simulator or both. Above that Appium also offers cross platform application testing. That is a single API that you guys can see out here on this part of the screen. A single API is actually going to work for both Android and iOS. Now recently Appium only was restricted to the mobile application testing domain, but with recent updates, especially Appium desktop since Appium 1.8, Appium has also moved forward into the domain of desktop application testing. So currently Appium with its single API, it allows us to test applications for Android, for iOS and for Windows OS. And when I say Windows OS, I don't mean the OS that would be running on phones. I mean Windows 10 and Windows 7 and Windows 8, that kind of stuff, and the applications that are built for them. So basically, it's one tool for testing various applications, whether it be native application, whether it be hybrid application, or whether it be web based application. So as you guys can see out here, our character Bob is really happy that he can now automate all his test cases and save a bunch of time doing much more productive stuff. Okay, now moving on, I just told you guys that Appium is used for native apps, hybrid apps, and web apps. So, what exactly are these? Well, these are just types of mobile applications. They are classified into three types, as you guys can see, and as you guys have already heard, that they are web applications, native applications, and hybrid applications. Now, let's take a look at them one by one and also try and understand the differences between these types of applications. Okay, so the first kind of applications that we're going to discuss are called web applications. Now web application is an application like any other. It's just that it's stored on the internet and to actually use the app, you'll be going through a browser sort of interface. So how are web apps different from a website? Well, a website typically provides users with a lot more information than is practical to display in a mobile site. Whereas a web app condenses this information to improve functionality. Web apps, however, do not need to be downloaded from the app stores like mobile apps. 
web apps load in browsers like Chrome, Safari, or Firefox. A web app also doesn't take up storage on the user's device. Now, people classify web apps as new technologies which blur the lines between web native and hybrid apps. It's kind of difficult to distinguish which apps are web apps and which are hybrid apps and which are website built with a responsive design. Sometimes what seems like a native app downloaded from the App Store is actually an app in a web view, which is written in the native language containing the URL to the web app. The majority of the code is handled outside of the native language. To some, that satisfies the requirement of a native application and to others, it's just another format for a web application. Web apps are essentially websites that look like native application, but instead of being installed on the home screen that users create a bookmark to, it's basically on your bookmarks in your web browser. Now the question comes, how do you build a web app? So typically, web apps are built using JavaScript, CSS, and HTML, and run inside a browser like Safari or Chrome. And there is no software development kit for developers to use. However, there are templates that developers can work with. If you choose to develop a web app, it can be straightforward and a quick to build. However, they are often oversimplified and don't offer the same features of native mobile applications. Now, web applications do come with their host of advantages. One is that you do not need to install anything. The second is that they are really cheap to actually develop and maintain. Above that, they're kind of fast depending on the speed of your internet. But in today's day and age, almost everybody has super fast internet. So web applications are kind of the way to go if you are looking for speed over the internet. Above that, they have a global access because you're not restricted by a Play Store or a marketplace of applications that is only catering to a certain operating system. And above that, setting and maintaining them is really, really easy. Some examples of web applications include Pixelr, Google Documentations, CodePen.io, and Evernote. Now, Google Applications or Google Docs, as you might know, is like an office suit and it's online. Pixelr is just picture editing application that runs on your browser. CodePen.io is like a repository of code like GitHub, but it also lets you see how your code is being developed and it's mainly used for web development purposes. Evernote, as you guys know, is everybody's note taking app and you should definitely use it. Up next, we have native mobile applications. Now, native mobile apps are the most common type of application. They are built for specific platforms and are written in languages that the platform accepts. For example, Swift and Objective-C for iOS, Java or Kotlin for native Android apps. Native apps are also built using the Specific Integrated Development Environment or IDE for the given operating system. So both Apple and Google provide app developers with their own development tool and interface and elements and SDKs. Most companies will invest in native mobile application development because there are a host of benefits offered in comparison to other types of applications. So let's go over a few of the advantages that come with native applications. So firstly, native apps are very fast and responsive because they are built for that specific platform. Secondly, they have the best performance that an application could offer. They are also distributed in the App Store, so you have the whole legitimacy aspect going on for them. Then they are more interactive, intuitive, and run much smoother in terms of user input and output. Above that, native applications allow developers to access the full feature set of their given platform with whatever performance optimizations the native system has. Above that, internet connection is not required, although it depends on the functionality. Last but not the least, overall better user experience is offered by native applications. So to the user, the flow is more natural as they have the specific UI standards for each platform. Now, this doesn't mean that native applications don't have some disadvantages. For example, native applications can be difficult to develop as their difficult languages are being used to actually develop them. So there might be a learning curve involved, unlike HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Also, they tend to be much more expensive because for the people that you will be employing to develop your native apps, they will be charging you for their education that has gone into actually learning how to deal with native apps, like how you would be paying a Swift developer or a IO or a generic Android developer or Kotlin developer or Java developer. So web apps can't access device features, which many view as a major disadvantage. However, on contrary, mobile apps need to keep downloading updates to improve accessibility, while web apps can update itself without any involvement of the user. Additionally, with native mobile application development, you get direct access to all native frameworks, which otherwise may not be available. 
Although the initial cost may be higher with a native app, you will end up saving a lot of time and money in the long run by offering a great user experience, better performance, and leveraging the device features, you're able to offer your user a more personalized experience. The combination of native mobile applications advantages will result in higher conversion rates and will ultimately boost customer loyalty for your app. Now, the last kind of applications that we're gonna discuss are called hybrid applications. Now, hybrid applications work across platforms and behave like native applications. A hybrid app is essentially a combination of native application and a web app. Users can install it on their device like a native application, but it is actually a web application, and these types of applications are built with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and run in the web view. Hybrid app development can essentially do everything HTML5 does, except it also incorporates native app features. This is possible when you deploy a wrapper to act as a bridge between the platform to access the native features. So basically, it's a web app that is wrapped around the native app features. Now, a hybrid app consists of two parts. The first is the backend code built using languages such as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And the second is a native shell that is downloadable and loads the code using a web view. Now, uh, hybrid applications come along with their own advantages too. So first of all, they're built on web technology that is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, so it's much easier to build. They're also a cheaper alternative to native applications. And one app for all platforms is a thing that hybrid application developers are going for. So it's basically one app and it works on every single platform. So it uses technologies like Cordova. Above that, no browser needed as opposed to a web app. So unlike a web app, which makes it quite ugly by introducing the whole browser view, hybrid apps completely negate that even though they are indeed using a web app in its core. Above that, hybrid apps can access to the device's internal APIs and can access storage cameras, etc. Above that, it's faster to develop than native apps because you have a single code base. This also doesn't mean that they don't have their disadvantages. For example, they're slower than native apps. They're also more expensive than web apps because you require a wrapper. Essentially, you're dependent on a third-party platform. They're also less interactive than native apps and customizations will take you away from the hybrid model in which you may as well go native. So with hybrid, you have to contend with issues that stem from both native systems and hybrid systems, which makes bug fixing more difficult. The performance is also a disadvantage because hybrid apps load in web view. The user experience is often sacrificed with a hybrid app as you cannot customize the app based on the platform. Another disadvantage is that you can customize your app the way you would be able to do with a native app. In fact, the more customizations you do, the more you're steering towards a native solution, so you might as well take the native approach. Additionally, the more customizations you want within your hybrid app, the more expensive and therefore a native solution will end up being a more cost-effective one. So if you do choose to customize your hybrid app, you'll end up spending a lot more money and time. So when it comes down to a web application versus a native application versus a hybrid application, which approach is the best? Well, the decision to build either a web, native, or hybrid mobile app should be based on your business objectives. Before jumping into development, you should consider the following factors, like how fast you need the app, the quality of the user experience you want your app to have, the complexity of the features you need for your app to work, and your budget. So keeping all these things in mind, you can very well decide whether you need a hybrid application, a native application or just a simple web application. Okay, so now moving on, let's get back to Appium and now let's discuss why you should choose Appium when there are so many other competitors in the market. Okay, so now that we have discussed the three different types of applications, when you should try and develop them, in what use cases and the different advantages along with their few examples, let us move forward to the spotlight of today's tutorial and that is the tool called Appium. Now, the topic that we're gonna currently discuss is why you should choose Appium. So the best way to convince somebody to choose a certain tool is by comparing it with its market competitors. For this particular comparison, I have kept the comparison between free and open source tools instead of paid enterprise versions. So since Appium is free and open source, it is only fair that we compare them to other free automation testing tools. Okay, so the tools that we are gonna test Appium against are Selendroid, which is basically Selenium for Android, and Robotium. So firstly, let us go ahead and see the features of Appium that make it such a beautiful choice. So firstly, Appium is free and open source. Secondly, it supports both iOS and Android apps for testing purposes. Above that, 
when you use Appium, there is no need for the app source code to be available to the tester as he can just test the app without reinstalling the application, which brings us to the fourth point that Appium never reinstalls the application again and again because Appium actually believes in testing the app that you will actually release to the marketplace. So when you reinstall an application with third party agents for automating purposes, it kind of beats the purpose. Above that, Appium supports multiple frameworks and programming languages like Ruby, Scala, Kotlin, Java, Python, and a bunch of other different languages. Last but not the least, Appium has a strong, active, and budding community, which means any help that you need will be actually given to you by the community itself because it's such a proactive one. Okay, now let's discuss how Cylindroid compares with Appium. So Cylindroid is Selenium for Android, which is also a free and open source automation testing tool. Unfortunately, as the name suggests, Cylindroid can only be used for testing Android apps. Above that, Cylindroid also needs the app source code or the app library that has been used for development. Also, the thing that actually puts Cylindroid quite, quite back is that it only supports Android 2.3 through Android 4.4. And we are currently at Android 8, I guess. I might be wrong. We, we could be on Android 9. I'm not really up to date with how Android is going about. About that, Cylindroid is also compatible with Selenium and Jenkins, which is great. And uh, Cylindroid also has a community going for it, but it's not as strong as Appium's. Now, let's get down to discussing about Robotium. So, Robotium is also a free and open source automation testing tool. Unfortunately, it only supports Android. It also needs the app source code and library. Above that, small changes in the Robotium code could actually lead you to completely rebuild the application. Above that, Robotium only supports Java, so other languages that are used to develop applications like Kotlin, for example, which has become really famous in these days, it will not be actually supported by Robotium. Above that, it is not at all compatible with stuff like Selenium and Jenkins. Also, Robotium doesn't really have that great a community. So as you guys can see, these points that have become red now are kind of what draws them back when compared to Appium. Appium, on the other hand, outshines in front of its market competitors, that is Cylindroid and Robotium. You guys can also compare Appium with other free and open source automation testing tools. And I assure you, Appium will stand out to be the best. It is with good reason that Appium has such a strong and budding community and such a wide scale acceptance around the globe amongst automation testers. So now that we have discussed why Appium stands out to be the best automation testing tool, let us go ahead and discuss the architecture that makes this tool so brilliant. So Appium is basically an HTTP server written in Node.js, which creates and handles multiple web driver sessions for different platforms like iOS and Android. So if that didn't make any sense to you, let me just simplify it a bit more. So what Appium does is it follows the client server architecture. Now on your left hand side of the screen, what you see is the, the client who is also the tester. Now what this guy will do is send some requests to the Appium server. Now these requests are the green arrows that you see. So first the request is sent to the Appium server. Now the Appium server along with its brilliant API decides how to actually handle the request and then with the appropriate decisions being made, by the server itself without any complications that you might need to worry about as a tester it sends these requests to the device and the emulator so the device or the emulator runs the test cases according to how they are written and then sends back the response to the appium server which in return sends it back to the client so appium starts a test case on the device that spawns the server and it listens for proxy commands from the main appium server it is almost same as a selenium server which perceives HTTP requests from Selenium client libraries and it handles those requests in different ways depending on the platform. Each vendor like iOS and Android have a different way and mechanism to run a test case. And so Appium kind of hacks into it and runs these test cases after listening commands from the Appium server. So first of all, let's discuss how Appium works on an iOS device. On iOS, basically, Appium proxies commands to a UI automation script running in Mac instrumentation environment. Apple provides this application called Instruments, which is used to do lots of activities like profiling, controlling, and building iOS apps. But it also has an automation component where we can write some commands in JavaScript 
which uses UI automation APIs to interact with the app UI. Appium utilizes these same libraries to automate iOS apps. So in the diagram that you see on your screen, we can see that the architecture of Appium in context to iOS automation. If we talk about the command life cycle, it goes like Selenium WebDriver. It picks up a command from the code like element.click and sends it in the form of a JSON representation via an HTTP request to the Appium server. Now Appium server knows the automation context like iOS and Android and sends this command to the instrument command server, which will wait for the instrument command client written in Node.js to pick it up and execute it in bootstrap.js within the iOS implementation environment. Now once the command is executed, the command client sends back the message to the Appium server, which logs everything related to the command in its console. This cycle keeps going till the time all the commands get executed. Now let's move forward and see how Appium works on Android. Now the situation is almost similar in case of Android where Appium proxies commands to a UI automator test case running on the device. So UI automator is Android's native UI automation framework which supports running JUnit test cases directly into the device from the command line. It uses Java as a programming language, but Appium will make sure it runs from any of the web driver supported languages. So in the diagram that you see, we have the bootstrap.jar in place of the bootstrap.js, which represents our test case when compiled in Java. As soon as it gets launched, it spawns a TCP server. Here the TCP server resides inside the device and the client is in the Appium process, which is just opposite to the way it is in iOS. Okay, so that was all about how Appium works on both iOS and Android and the small nitty gritties that make out the difference between the two systems. Now let's move ahead and discuss the philosophy of Appium. So Appium is a rising star in the mobile test automation landscape. And since a few of the developers here at Sauce Lab are regular committers to the project, it's pretty close to their heart. Now you'll often find Sauce Lab developers hanging out at the Appium Google group, answering questions, musing about testing strategies and helping folks tweak their configuration or hunt down bugs. When it comes to mobile test automation, in many ways, they're still figuring out the best approaches and with Appium, the benefits of lessons learned from early automation solution that didn't quite work as well. So these guys actually put up something called the four point Appium philosophy. So the philosophy is as it goes. So firstly, the first philosophy is you shouldn't have to recompile your apps or modify it in any way in order to automate it. The second one is you shouldn't be locked into a specific language or framework to write and run your tests. Thirdly, a mobile automation framework shouldn't reinvent the wheel when it comes to automation APIs. And fourth is that a mobile automation framework should be open source in spirit and practice as well as in name. So let's explore these four points, shall we? Now you shouldn't have to recompile your app or modify it in any way in order to automate it. So some earlier attempts at mobile test automation were based around OCR and pixel based interaction, which history tells us are never very reliable. After that, we saw the introduction of in app agents that can execute the underlying code that would otherwise be triggered by a user interacting with the application. These agents then make calls to the same code triggering user actions like swipes and taps and pinches. It's not a bad solution, but it's that it's got you to have to compile these agents into your app while it's being tested and you probably want to take it out after testing is done. The result, you're not actually testing the code that you release. So the agent approach is a bit odd. Since the real world user actions are always from outside the app itself. And so if you're simulating those actions inside code rather than triggering them by the corresponding UI actions, you're that much further away from the real experience of an actual human user. In order to solve the problem and provide for testing with these more real world style users, both Apple and Google have created their interface automation frameworks for the respective development environments. Google provides UI Automator, which is a Java API for simulating these UI actions on Android devices and emulators, and Apple provides UI Automation Instruments, a JavaScript programming interface for use with iOS devices and simulators. So Appium works by interfacing with these vendor provided automation frameworks translating your test code into platform specific interactions. And I think that this is a better approach than using an agent since you don't have to compile a test and build that which contains code which will not be in the production build. So you're best off testing the same code you will release. 
The next two points of Appium philosophy are covered together since they both derive from the decision to implement the WebDriver API and the JSON wire protocol. So you shouldn't be locked into a specific language or framework to write and run your test and a mobile automation framework shouldn't reinvent the wheels when it comes to automation APIs. So a web driver is already well known as the engine behind Selenium 2 test automation for web apps. In Appium implementation, instead of using a web browser on a desktop operating system as Selenium does, Appium drives native apps and browsers on mobile operating systems. Many testers are already very familiar with writing and running tests locally using Selenium web drivers where you will open a web browser, run through some interactions with the app and verify that the test cases passes. But the magic of WebDriver really happens when it is used in a distributed fashion. Instead of making local calls directly to the browser, the WebDriver test becomes an HTTP client and makes requests to a WebDriver server, which in turn actually makes the necessary calls to the browser and the application. The elegance of Appium is that it utilizes this framework to interact not with the desktop browser, but with Android's UI Automator or Apple's UI Automation Instruments, which then performs user actions on the native app or mobile browser running in either an emulator or a real device. And of course, Sauce Labs infrastructure can manage all of this for you. Okay, so now before we get on with installing Appium, let me just go over the pros and cons of using Appium as a mobile application tester. Okay, so as you guys can already see, there are more pros and cons because Appium is a brilliant app. So let's go with the pros first one by one. So the first positive aspect of Appium that I have pointed out is that the complexity of the testing environment is completely encapsulated. So the beauty of Appium is that all the complexities are under the hood of Appium server and for an automation developer, the programming language and the whole experience would remain irrespective of the platform he is automating. That is iOS or Android. The other benefits of Appium is that it opens the door to cross-platform mobile testing, which means the same test would work on multiple platforms. Above that, unlike other tools, Appium doesn't require you to include some extra agent in your app to make it automation friendly. It believes in the philosophy of testing that the same app which we are going to be submitting to the application store. Also, it is developed and supported by Sauce Lab and it is getting picked up really fast within the WebDriver community for mobile automation and it can automate web, hybrid and native mobile applications. On the sides of cons, we have only one and that is it is difficult to scale. So scaling up is an important consideration with continuous integration and Appium comes across as a great tool to fulfill this expectation. The reason for this is a technical limitation. In iOS, we can only run one instance on instruments per Mac OS. So we can only run our iOS scripts on one device per Mac machine. So if we want to run our tests on multiple iOS devices at the same time, then we would need to arrange the same number of Mac machines, which would basically be a very costly affair. But this limitation can be resolved if we execute our scripts in Sauce Labs Mobile Cloud, which at present supports running scripts on multiple iOS simulators. Above that, Appium uses UI Automator for Android automation, which only supports Android SDK platform that is API 16 or higher. So to support the older APIs, they have used another open source library called Selendroid. So I would not say it is a limitation, but it is definitely an overhead on the configuration side. Okay, so that was on the pros and cons of Appium. So let's go ahead and now get on with the demonstration part of our video today. And that is actually installing Appium and integrating it with Android Studio in this case. So now that we're done with the theoretical part of this Appium tutorial, it's time we actually go ahead and install Appium on our own systems. Now Appium has a bunch of dependencies that it depends on for running seamlessly on your system and they're pretty easy to install. I know there's a buzz in the community that Appium can be a real pain to install on your system, but that's all a myth because I can assure you that it's a very simple process and all you have to do is follow me step by step. Now, first of all, we have to install Java onto our systems if it's not already installed. Now, if you want to know if Java is already installed on your system, all you have to do is go into your command prompt and just type in Java. Now, if you have Java installed, it should show up a help menu that shows something like this. So Java has already been installed on my computer and I'm going to show you exactly how I did it. So first of all, you have to go to the Oracle page out here. Now you can really do that by just going to Google and typing in Java and space download. Now you will be redirected to the Java SE Development Kit 11 download, which is basically Java 11. 
Now, what you want to do is, according to your system, whether you were running Linux, Mac, or Windows, personally, I'm running Windows 10 at this moment, I am going to download this one. So this .exe file that you see out here. So go ahead and download it. Okay, so it seems that I must agree to the license agreement before downloading. So you can do that by just checking the radio button out here. And all you have to do is then click on this link and it will start up your download. So as you guys can see, this is downloading. I'm not going to actually download this file because I already have Java installed. But after you download this file, all you have to do is double click and follow the instructions that come onto the screen. So the tricky part is, uh, well, it's not actually tricky. All you have to do is set the environment variable so that your computer knows where you've actually stored the Java SDK and the Java runtime environment. So after you've installed Java with the .exe file, uh, you can go ahead into this PC, go into local to C, and going to program files. Now program files should have a Java file which will have your Java JDK, which is your Java development kit, and open up a new window of this PC, go into program files x86, and you will also see a Java file out here. So this is your JRE. So let's keep these open. Once you have installed or run the .exe file that we just downloaded, you should have these two files that are going for you. Now all you have to do is copy the path of these files and set the environment variables. Now, all you have to do is go into your search menu and type for environment variables. It might ask you for your password just like this. So let me just enter my password. Okay, so out here, you have to click on environment variables. So as you guys can see, I have set my path out here for Java Home and GRE Home. So to do that out here, all you have to do is go in and type Java underscore home and you give the variable value as the JDK file. So you go into JDK. You copy down this entire path and you just paste it out here. Now, I'm not going to really add this because I already have that added. You have to do the same thing for JRE. So, once you have that going on, you should have something like this Java Home and JRE Home. Once you have that set up, all you have to go and do is under system variables, find this thing called path, I'm going to edit, and you should see something like this out here. So, all you have to do is type in a uh, percentage sign java underscore home percentage sign and the bin so basically what you're doing out here is giving your computer access to the bin folder which has all the dll files which is necessary to run java on your machine okay so that takes care of java for now so once you have java installed on your computer as i just said all you have to do is go into command prompt and just type in java and it should give you up this menu so if that menu comes up you're well and good. Now the next thing that we actually need to install is out here and that is Android Studio. Now all you need to do to install Android Studio is go ahead and download Android Studio. Now it's a pretty big file. It's 948 MB. That's around a gig of data. So I'm not really going to download this because I already have it downloaded. But once you download it, it's basically a .exe file and you have to just go ahead and read the on-screen menu and just install it. It's like installing any other tool or game that you write to on your computer. Now, once that is installed, you should have something like this on your computer. So go into program files and you should find Android and Android Studio. Now for Android Studio also, we need to set up the environment variables. So to do that again, we have to go in and get the environment variables part up. So let me just get in my password in. Okay, so that does it. Now you go into environment variables and what we have to do is put in this thing called Android Home. Now Android Home is set in your local disk C. You're going to users, go into your user that you're using, that is Arya Paul, and out here you see app data. Now if you can't see app data, go into view and all you have to do is tick this hidden items checkbox out here and it will show you all the hidden files and folders. So you go into app data, go into local, go into Android, go into SDK, and all you have to do is copy down this path, go into environment variables, say new, give a name of Android Home, as you guys can see. It doesn't really matter what you name it, to be honest, and then just give it the value. And that is, let me just go back again, copy this, and all you have to do is paste that. So as you guys can see, it's under C users, and the particular user that you're using, app data, local, Android, and then SDK. I'm not going to set it because I already have that set out here. 
and after that all you have to do is go to path again so let's go down to the path and you have to edit the path and as you guys can see i've added two new things so one is the platform tools address and one is the tools address so you can find them out here so go to platform tools and copy down this address and go to path say new and just paste it out here now i'm not going to do anything because i already have that pasted so you have to do this for platform tools and tools both now once that is up and running you also have to install the adb drivers so for adb drivers all you have to do is go ahead and type in adb driver install so adb driver install the first link that you see out here should be the one that you have to install now you click on adb driver universal and that should get it downloading okay so once that has been downloaded go into show in folder and as you guys can see we have this thing called adb driver out here let me do that let me put this in a view that can make sense so adb driver so it's a compressed file now since it's a compressed file all you have to do is extract all now you can extract it to somewhere so i'm going to go ahead and extract it to my desktop so let's go ahead and extract that okay so now we have adb driver installer out here all you have to do is just click on the installer and let us do its job so i'm just going to put in my password again so it installs it okay so as you guys can see adb driver installer and if you have a device that is connected it should actually go ahead and install the adb driver for that so that was all about adb now the next thing that you need to download is a few more things so firstly we need to download appium itself so that's pretty simple all you have to go ahead and download is download appium so that can be found at appium.io so go ahead and download that and till then let's open up our android studio okay so once android studio has been actually opened up and you should get the screen on out here so all you have to do is say start a new android project and you should get the screen you can choose a basic activity for now because we are not really going to do any sort of development we are only interested in testing so i'm going to name my project demo and all you have to do is say finish you can also choose a minimum api level i'm going to choose it to be api so let's see put it at api 24 which is android 7 nougat so let's finish that okay so our project is now loading up so what we have to do is get our android studio to get integrated with our appium server so what you guys can see out here in this demo part is the project structure now you can go out here and go into project and go into demo and all you see is app file out here okay so now we are really interested in the app file and the libs folder now for the libs folder we need to put some stuff in so let's go back to our page and now we need to download a few stuff so out here you can see that i have the appium.io slash downloads.html page open so appium has a bunch of client libraries so for now we are going to be installing the java library so let's go ahead and download that so all you have to do is click on that link and then click download and you also have to download the selenium web drivers so we are going to be using java so let's go ahead and download that too so selenium java is downloading while ah so we need to download the jar files so that will also get downloaded so let's keep this file so we have two files right now with us we have the java client 7.00 jar and the selenium java 3.14 okay so let's go ahead and find these in our folder okay so once you have both the files downloaded um, move them to a separate folder for now i'm going to cut them I'm going to go ahead to my desktop and let's make a new folder called dependencies and you can name your folder whatever you want i'm going to paste these out here so that i can find them in a convenient manner now what i want to do is extract all of these out okay let's go and browse and we want to do it in dependencies so select folder and we want to do extract so once that has been extracted what we are interested in is the java client and these files okay so if you go back to android studio out here and you open the project structure you can see your libraries folder now what we want to do is put in all these files into the lib folder so if you go ahead out here and see 
our project is stored in under users and under our ball under Android Studio project and under demo so first of all copy this file the Java client so let's copy that let's go to this PC let's go to local to C let's go to users our ball and we want to go into Android Studio projects we want to go into demo we want to go to app go to libraries and just start pasting your stuff there Go back into dependencies and what we want to do is go into the libs folder and copy all this and go into the libs folder of our Android project and just paste it there. So once that is done, what we want to do is go back out here and check if these things have been actually put in our lib folder. So if you see, we have an arrow now and you see we have all these things out here. Okay, so now what we need to do is tell Android Studio that all these jar files will be used in our library. So go ahead, select all these and right click on them. And all you have to do is add as library. So this will be added as a library to the app module. Okay. So our app module has a library now. Fine. Okay, so after you've added those files as a library, you should get a build.gradle file under your app folder. So let's go ahead and open that. Okay, so once that is done, all you have to do is go in here and go into run. And all you have to say is rebuild project. I don't think it's in run. Okay, it's in build. So all you have to do is open your build file and you have to rebuild your project. So sometimes it will sync automatically. And when this build is done, it means that you have successfully integrated Appium into your Android Studio. Okay, guys, so as you guys can see, our build has successfully completed. And since our build has successfully completed, this means that Appium has been successfully integrated with our Android Studio. And now we can proceed and write our test cases. And that I will be actually tackling in the next video where we'll be writing our first test case for our first app. So this brings us to the end of this video today. I hope you take back something fruitful from this video. And I hope you guys are ready with Appium installed on your servers and your systems next time. Until then, goodbye. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!